we've been journeying through Genesis. Uh, and actually, we've, I've been really good at videotaping them and getting them online. So if you've missed something and want to catch up, it is, it is online. You can, you can catch up to, to the, the silly story. Uh, the narrative that we're in here, the journey through Genesis. And what we're at right now is we're at that point in uh, Genesis where uh, Jacob has, uh, he's, he's kind of done his little mini exodus last year, last week, where he was out away, it's where he met his wives, they had the baby off, they had all that sort of stuff happening, right? And now he's coming back into the land. That's what, where we're at. So if, if you're wondering where we're at, that's where we're at. Um, but this whole thing, you're going to see consistently that God is, God's really, really growing, growing Jacob. And really, the, consistently throughout all this, God seems to just continually be making uh, Jacob a little bit of a, uncomfortable just to kind of grow him. And it's one of those things that when we see this, we see that, that sometimes what God's trying to put us, you know, he's not trying to put us at ease so much sometimes. Sometimes he's trying to grow us. And that's, there's going to be some big spiritual growth that's going to happen with Jacob uh, during this, this story. So if you'd like to open your Bibles, I'm going to start with a, uh, kind of a flashback, a recap of, of what's happening. Just to set us up. Because what Jacob's about ready to go back into the land, one of his big concerns is his brother. And we're going to see why. So picking up, just to remember the, the prophecy that the mom had before he had two, two children. So if you don't know who Jacob is, Jacob's the son of Isaac. Who's Isaac? Isaac's the son of Abraham. Father Abraham, you have many sons. Anyway, so there, that's who we got. So Jacob, now Jacob has a brother, and his brother is? Esau. Esau. Do they get along? No. Esau is very much about, he's a man's man, he wants to get what he wants to get out of his own, you know, with my own hands, that sort of thing. Didn't have a lot of, the, the whole idea of being the, the son of promise, God's son of promise, wasn't very important to him. That sort of, he didn't care about something God would give him, he only wanted something that he could make with his own hands, or take with his own hands. That was kind of his deal. Jacob was not quite that way. Jacob had other strengths and weaknesses. Um, and, but Jacob did, he did want to be blessed. He did want that sort of thing. And up to two, uh, there was a prophecy that the younger, who was Jacob, uh, would be the, the one that would be the blessed one. So here is the prophecy the mom said. And the Lord told her, this is to uh, uh, Jacob's mom, uh, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other. And the older son will serve the younger son. Is that normally how things go? No. So God's turning things, deliberately turning things on their end. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of things where what's happening is God is taking um, the blessing that is supposed to be on one is given to another. By grace, it's kind of what he's doing. And it's, there's some neat imagery, some covering imagery that we talked about a couple weeks ago. But continuing on. So then what happens is there's a couple moments where Jacob, uh, Jacob kind of uh, trades trades Esau for his birthright for a cup of uh, warm red stew, right? That's a, I didn't know that that was the going rate of birthrights, but but I guess I guess some time ago that's what he just said. It was just he was hungry, so he wanted some soup. So he got that. And then the last thing that happened is right before, as Isaac's about ready to, to bless the children. Now, who was Isaac supposed to bless? Now, by by law, he, he like originally he should have blessed Esau, except Esau had sold the blessing, and more than that, there's a prophecy that said, who's the, supposed to be the son of promise? Jacob. 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 So, so um, what happens is Isaac wants to bless Esau because he loves Esau, not be obedient to Jacob. So what happens is Re Rebecca saves the day, right? What she do? She kind of dresses the other one up to kind of have a Mission Impossible moments, and uh, in comes Jacob. He gets the blessing because God confuses Isaac and moves Isaac back on track. Thank God, right? Thank God he got him back on track. Um, and then what happens is then, then Jacob goes forward. Now Esau's not very happy about this. So this happens right after this. It says, from that time on, Esau hated Jacob because their father had given Jacob the blessing. And Esau began to scheme, I will soon be mourning my father's death. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Does that sound fun? No. Again, there's so many times in the Bible, I love the fact how, how honest the Bible is about these people. Because, you know, every family has problems. Some families have bigger problems than others. And when we look here, this person who's a spiritual, we would almost call him a superhero. We'd look at Jacob 
didn't know Jacob. He's just an amazing believer. But does he have issues in his family? Yeah. Are some of them his, his fault? Yes. <laughs> now, the neat thing is that Jacob, God moves powerfully through Jacob because of who God is, not necessarily who Jacob is. I think that's an important thing to see. But we see that, that this struggle that, that starts out here in this prophecy and continues on, it continues on, and it'll last several lifetimes. Not only is it not only is it Jacob and Esau's problem, eventually all the Esau's descendants become the Edomites, and, and all of Jacob's descendants become the Israelites, right? And who Moses wrote this to is a bunch of people that are in the desert, right? Get ready to go in the promised land, and guess who they're going to have to come up against? among other folks. The Edomites. The Edomites had already given them some problems. So they could look and go, oh my goodness, this thing, is, this has been going on for 400 years by their time. But Rebecca heard Esau's plans. So she sent Jacob and uh, she sent for Jacob and told him, listen, Esau is consoling himself by plotting to kill you. So listen carefully, my son. Uh, get ready and flee my brother to my brother Laban and Haran. Stay there with him until uh, my brother until your brother cools off. When he calms down and forgets what you've done to him, I will send uh, for you to come back. Why should I lose both of you in one day? And she's like, you know what? He's just waiting for your dad to die. As soon as your dad dies, he wants to kill you. I don't want to lose either of you. Go find a wife. Over with your uncle. Go to your uncle's house, find a wife, come back. All makes sense, right? Well, what's happening here is Esau's now starting to plot to kill Jacob. So what is happening is, is, is Rebecca's first plan here is, hey, go hide out while your brother cools down. I'll send for you. That's kind of what happened before. And then last week's sermon was what was happening while it was in there. However, uh, it kind of it's kind of like, hey, go hang out for a little while and I'll send for you. Does she send for him in a little while? No. Last week, we were covering that time that he was with Laban. Do you remember how many years offhand? Do you remember? 20 years later. 20 years later. Oh, my goodness. He's out there for 20 years waiting for that. Hey, come on home. It's okay. It's okay to come home. So Jacob's getting ready to return the land. And this is how he gets the message. And Jacob begins to notice the change in Laban's attitude toward him. This is the... In that 20th year, then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your father and grandfather and your relatives there, and I will be with you. Now, did he get a note from his mom? Okay, who is sending him back to the land? Jesus. Yeah, who oh God, yes. So God is sending Jacob back into the land. And Jacob has to make a decision to go, is, Am I going to follow God? Now, right there, he says, uh, to the land of your relatives. Well, who does he have problems with? His relatives. He's not like, hey, go back to the mall that you really like. You're going to go back to that hometown that has that cool mall. This is not what he's talking about. He's not saying, hey, go to back to the movie theater that you like, the hometown of Malt Shop or that sort of thing. He's not telling them the night. He's telling them the thing that he's scared of most. Not that they had movie theaters or malt shops or malls back then. But, um, now, but what does God promise in this statement, too? He says, what does he say? That last phrase right there? I will be with you. I will be with you. So he gives them a command to be to do something, right? God says, do this thing, and I will be with you. Do this very scary thing. Now, is this a scary thing? Is it likely his dad is still alive 20 years later? No. no. So there is no barrier. It's not even likely his mom is alive. Who is likely to be alive is that Esau character who wants to kill him. So Jacob started on his way again, and the angel of the Lord came to meet him. When Jacob saw him, uh, he exclaimed, this is God's camp. So he named the place uh, Mahani. Okay, now here's an interesting picture about, uh, and we've seen this as we follow the narration. He's coming back into the land, and as he enters, uh, as he kind of enters the border of the land, he meets the angel of the Lord there. And we see that a lot. That kind of like the, the guardian or the border patrol of the land is God. God chooses who comes into the land and who doesn't come into the land. In the same sense, this is very real. This is very real for the Israelites too. Because who's traveling? Isn't the, the fire is traveling with the, with the Israelites? And for them to cross into the land, the angel of the Lord is, is saying whether or not they can go in or not go in. So there's 
for in the narrative, it's a big thing at Border Patrol. God is picking who comes in here. And for us, we're so, this is kind of a callback to some of those earlier moments. Because when Jacob left the land, the last thing he did in the land is he laid his head down on his pillow. What did he see? He saw the, the ladder of angels. So he's like, surely God's in this land. And he let it leave. So we're supposed to remember that. We're supposed to notice that, hey, when Abraham entered the land, there was the angel of the Lord that's going to be that wall. Or the same thing. And this is kind of that parallel between the Garden of Eden and what did God, what did God station on the outside of the Garden of Eden? Angels. To keep, to keep the man, to keep Adam out of the Garden. Now we see that, that, that kind of that repetitive thing in the narrative of the land of the land. God picking who's on stage for, for, for his purpose. Then Jacob sent messengers ahead of it to his brother Esau, who was living in the region of Seir in the land of Edom. Now, is, is, is uh, Esau where they were at before? No, he's not. He's, Esau has already gone and started making a kingdom for himself in the Edom. And he's going to be the, the, the big cheese, the head of the Edomites. Uh, he told them, I give this message to my master Esau. Humble greetings from your servant Jacob. Until now I've been living with Uncle Laban, and now I own cattle, donkeys, flocks, sheep, goats, and many servants, both men and women. I have sent these uh, messengers to inform my Lord of my coming, hoping that you will be friendly to me. Now what's he trying to say here in this? He's rich. I'm rich. Now remember all the stuff that he has rights to because Esau signed it away? Esau's had possession of that stuff. And he's coming in and he's saying, first things first, I got stuff. I don't need to take all the stuff from you that is technically mine. But in a sense, he's like, hey, I don't need any of you. You have it. You've been doing great with it for 20 years. It's yours. You know, that kind of stuff. Because he's trying to make peace. But part of it is, why is it now? He's, he's doing this because he's afraid. We're going to find out he's afraid. God has told him to do something he's afraid to do. Has God ever told you to do something you're afraid to do? So what's happening? Well, if he hasn't yet, he will. Because that's part of how he grows. After delivering the message, the, the messengers returned to Jacob and reported, uh, we met with your brother Esau, and he is all right, and he's on his way to meet you with an army of 400 men. Jacob was terrified by the news. Like, it's worse than you thought. Like, like before, he just thought his brother was waiting to beat him up. But he's, got a, he's assembled an army to come and meet him. Now, imagine God is telling you to do something. God says, hey, I want you to go make peace with this one person. And you, you're like, okay, I've got to go make peace with that one person. And as you step toward that one person, that one person comes up with their whole gang of folks ready to beat you up. It's worse than you thought. Well, what do you do? I'm sorry, what was it? You still obey. Is it easy to do? I just fight. You just fight. Well, that's not what you're called to do at this point. You obey. But see, that's where the growth happens. Listen, God is going to tell you to do a lot of things in life like Jacob. And the easy stuff, the easy stuff to do when God says, hey, go eat ice cream with somebody, sometimes that's an easy thing to do, right? Is it God's will to eat ice cream with people sometimes? Yes, sometimes. Sometimes. That is, is it God's will for us to suffer with some people sometimes? Is that as easy to do? And sometimes God's going to put us there, and what's going to happen is that point where we're having to compare truths. God said something like this, go to this land, I will be with you, I will keep you safe. Your brother is coming, he's got an army of people coming to kill you. Leave. Those are two truths. One of those is true. And he's got to make a choice between the two truths. So he has what we call, we call this crisis of faith. And really, for us, it's figuring out who we serve. He said, we obey, right? That's what we should do. I would love to say that in my life, I obeyed every time, first time out. But there's a truth. That crisis of faith that we all should have, as we grow as believers, we are going to have crisis of faith. There's going to be a point where we're going to have doubt. If you're not doubting yet, if you've never got a point to doubt, then you haven't really stepped out of your comfort bubble. You're still on milk. To get out in life, you've got to get to that point where what you want to do is go in one direction, what God wants to do in another direction, so that you can then have to make that choice. Well, I'm going to follow God. Okay, here's the deal. There are plenty of people 
that do what God wants them to do when they want to do it. Are they following God or not? What it means to be a true follower of God is to follow Him when He's telling you to go to a place you don't want to go. Up until then, it's all, you know, it's all pretend. Yes? Delayed obedience is disobedience. You're right, delayed obedience is disobedience. But for him, he's, he's at that point where he's struggling. He doesn't know what to do. Well, he knows what to do. God told him to go. But every bone in his body is saying go. But that's a crisis of faith for us, is those points where we have to check back and see, well, who really is serving who? See, because there's plenty of there's plenty of religions out there where what they would do is they would go out and you'd give money to the little statue and rub the belly, and then the, that spiritual power was supposed to do what you wanted them to do. That wooden idol, that, that statue, that whatever was going to do that sort of thing. He's going to, going to be on your side. You're going to call God, do this for, for me, because I'm really in charge of the universe. You're just the, the way, you know, a tool. Well, no, Christianity is the other way. Because when we talk about our God, we talk about him as our Lord, our boss. So Jacob was terrified of this news. He divided his household uh, along with the flocks and herds, camels, into two groups. And he thought, if Esau means one group and attacks it, perhaps the other group will escape. So he's making very practical decisions right there. Is that what God said? Did God say, hey, make a really good practical plan, and by your wits you will be saved? Nope. So Jacob's doubt. But here's the amazing thing. The truth of, of, of God saving Jacob, as we saw last week with Laban, Jacob wasn't making the good choices with Laban at the end there, but God still saved him. Intervened, gave a dream to, to Laban and said, hey, don't mess with this guy. And then Laban said, I was going to fight you, but now I'm not. Was, so Jacob is doubting, but i got to tell you, what he's doing right here is he knows that God said go. He said, no, what did I say? I say, God said go and he'd be with me, but now there's this, right? There's this one thing. God said go, but this isn't going to be as easy as I thought. You know, and, and there's kind of those people that would turn around and would say something like this. Well, you know, after all, God helps those who help themselves. Is it in the Bible that God helps those who help themselves? No, have we heard it all the time? All the time people will say that. You'll hear that all the time. This wisdom, God helps those who help themselves. No. So he's like trying to figure it out. He's trying to suss it out, trying to figure it out. No, it's not right. Then Jacob prayed, oh God. So Jacob does the right thing right here. He goes, okay, my heart says do this one thing. Run away. My emotions say run away. You have told me to go into the land. Okay, God, let's sort this out. Then God prayed, Oh, God of my grandfather Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O oh Lord, you said to me, uh, Return to the land, uh, to your own land, and to your relatives, and you <coughs> promised me I will be with you, uh, I will be with you uh, kindly. I am not worthy of your unfailing love and faithfulness that you have shown me, your servant. When I left home and crossed the Jordan River, I found nothing except a walking stick. Now my household fills two large camps. And what he does right here, I'm, I love this about Jacob, is that when he is, uh, when he's in conflict, what he does is he reaches out to God. Now I'll tell you this though, what this conflict is, is he's trying to figure out which truth does he believe. Does he believe the truth that God said? So he's pulling up God's word. God's word is this. You said you would be with me. Surely you're with me even to the end of the age. That's what you said. And remember how we talked about the parallel, that that's the same, the same blessing that Jacob got was the blessing the church got too, right? Go and make disciples as you will be fruitful and multiply. In all the nations, the same idea, you'll be a blessing to the nations. And what does Jesus say to the church? He says, and surely I'm with you, even to the end of the age. This is kind of what, he's coming back. He's like, yeah, I know that you said you're going to be with me. I know that, <laughs> this is a pearl we can make. Okay, God, I know that you said to love my neighbor, and here I am at this point, and it's scary, and it's going to be costly, and I don't know how it's going to be. You told me to love your neighbor. I'm loving my neighbor. This is really going to be hard. 
But you know what? I'm going to trust that when you said that you're with me, even to the end, that you're with me. Like Jacob. He's questioning, am I doomed or saved? Now, this is what I really want to point out here, too, is the fact that does he feel like he's safe right now? Does he feel safe? No. No. He doesn't feel safe. Is he saved? Yes. yes. I, you know, when I was a young believer, I think there was a million times that the pastor would ask anybody that wants to know Jesus, be Jesus, you know, pray this little prayer, God, I want to be a follower of you, right? I give up being a leader of my life. I know I've messed up. I want to be a follower of you. I want to be forgiven of sin. And the pastor would say it week after week. And you know how many times I prayed that prayer? Because I never felt saved. I was still in struggles. Well, here's the question. Is he saved? He's saved. Does he feel saved? No. Well, feeling saved isn't the same as being saved. Being saved is simply, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, will be saved if you feel so, right? No. It's a change of state. You're adopted. Ricky, you're my son. Whether or not you feel it, you're my son, right? That's your state. You can be happy about a death, sad, sad, struggle. Your emotion about the, that relationship doesn't change the relationship. It's a change of state. So he is, but what he's doing is when he's trying, at that growth part, what he's doing is that's where he's, he's sitting and he's trying to sit and figure it out. Oh, Lord, please rescue me from the hand of my brother Esau. He's just deliberate now. He's like, okay, I know I quoted. I quoted what you told me. I quoted the scripture. Specifically, this is where I'm struggling with it. Oh, Lord, please rescue me from the hand of my brother Esau. I am afraid that he is coming to attack me along with my wives and children. But you promised me I will surely treat you kindly and I will multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as the sands along the seashores, too many to count. God, by the way, I know that you're not new at this, but if I'm killed and my kids are killed, then probably I won't have descendants as far as they're right. just kind of... Hey, listen. Jacob is making the same kind of prayer I've made. Have I made prayers like this? Absolutely. God, I, I don't know. Sometimes you feel like maybe you're new on this. I, from my point of view, I'm, I'm lost. I'm scared. Does God zap Jacob for this? Listen, that honesty with God, when, we, when we're honest with God about our doubts and struggles, it gives God the opportunity to come in and reshape how we see the world. That's the truth. There are whole books of the Bible that start out with that, and that's part of the point. I don't want to use this one. Okay, I used to work with Marines, so I'm This is, this is going to turn people off. I, do, you, do you know the acronym Whiskey Tango Foxtrot? Okay. Just if, if you don't know it, please, you don't need to look it up. It's not a good one. Um, but for Marines, it was easy for me to say there are whole books of the Bible that start out with that. That's the starting point of that strong believer is what is going on, Lord? This isn't how things are supposed to be. Habakkuk. How long, O oh Lord, must I cry out for you and you do nothing? Must I see violence? And you don't help. Bad guys win, good guys lose. What's the deal, God? That's Rick's paraphrase at the beginning of Habakkuk. But Habakkuk also has the righteous will live by faith. Has the center theme for what the book of Romans is. Also ends with kind of this, this whole thing, though the, you know, even if the, the crops don't grow, even if there's no fruit on the vine, even if, even if the, the Dodgers, you know, lose the pennant, or whatever, you know, no matter what, you're God. It ends with this amazing praise, you know, some, some of the scriptures, you know, you make my feet like the hind feet of a deer. Some of these scriptures, beautiful scriptures at the end of Habakkuk, three chapters later, are, are these scriptures that we use in hymns and, and, and worship songs, but in order to get there, he had to start out with being honest with his struggles where he was at. And that's what Jacob's doing right here. 
I will surely treat you kindly. This is what you said. I, I will multiply your descendants until they become numerous uh, as the sands on the seashore. Too many to count. So what, what Jacob's choice, and this is the choice that he made. He said, I, I choose you to be my Lord and Savior. That's really what he's saying. I'm choosing that, that this sort of thing. But back to, back to this. Notice that choosing and feeling are not the same thing. He still does not feel secure. If you're looking to feel secure, that may not be the place. I mean, we say, we say that the, uh, the New Testament verse that says what? I'm pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned. What kind of feelings are being described when we say pressed and crushed? Are those uplifting? Even that is one of those things, you know, where we, we kind of, we stand up and we say, you know what, it feels difficult to be, it's uncomfortable where we're at, but we know, we claim that truth that when you say you're with us, you're with us. So Jacob stayed, and I got, you know, I should hit the converse. There are plenty of people that feel that they're okay and they're not. Because sin is dealt with through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Amen. When Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and life, no one gets to the Father except through me. How some, some, somebody sincerely feels is not going to get them there. It's not enough. So Jacob stayed where he was for the night. Then he selected gifts from his possessions to present to his brother, for his brother Esau. 200 female goats, 200 male goats, or 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 ant lambs, uh, 15 uh, female donkeys, that's 30 is the, well that's the first number, <laughs> female donkeys, and, uh, and young, uh, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and, uh, and a partridge in a pear tree, a whole bunch of stuff, right? And ten male donkeys, he divided these animals and herds and, and gave them each to different servants. Then he told his servants, go ahead of me with these animals, but keep some distance between. So he's still doing, trying to do the cunning thing, right? He's like, I'm going to send out one, and if he gobbles them up, then I'll know he's real man. And if he doesn't, they'll go on, and we'll send another one, and we'll send another one. He's really kind of doing this. Because, now, did he cross into the, has he crossed in yet? Is he going to meet his brother? No. But has it turned away? No. So he is struggling physically to obey. He's like, God, you say go in. I can't go in, but I don't want to leave because I don't want to be disobedient, but I don't want to go in. So he's struggling. He's in this, uh, he's, he's really sitting there. So, and this is really kind of the truth. By the way, this is the truth about growing, growing in Christ, is you're going to have to find those spot, spots in your life. God's telling me, but I don't want to go. And it's in that spot that you're growing in Christ. Now, he gave uh, these instructions to the men leading the first group. Uh, when my brother Esau meets you, he'll ask, whose servants are you? Uh, where are you going? Who owns these animals? You must reply, uh, they belong to your servant Jacob, but uh, they are a gift to the master Esau. Look, he's coming right behind us. Jacob gave the same instructions to the second and the third herdsmen, all who followed behind. Uh, you must say the same thing to Esau when you meet him, and be sure to say, look, uh, your servant Jacob is right behind us. So really, now I'll tell you this. Salvation is a settled issue. For Jacob, it's true. For us, it's true. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, salvation is a settled issue. You can absolutely know that you're going to heaven. Now, growing in Christ... That requires obedience. That requires the growth. That requires real struggle. Jacob is saved. Jacob is owned by God no matter what. But for him to be a stronger believer, to grow up, and every time that the Bible's talking about maturing, you know, spiritual, you know, growing in Christ, it means kind of coming into those areas of life where you've been disobedient to God, but you you. You give up, you surrender that area, and you allow God to lead and, and go forward that way. I mean, here's another picture of it. I'm going to uh, quote Paul right here. Paul says this in Romans. Uh, this is a truth that we all have. The trouble is with me, for I am 
all too human, a slave to sin. I really don't understand myself, for I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But I know that what I'm doing is wrong and shows that I agree with the law, and the law is good, so I am not the one doing wrong, but it's sin living within me. He's describing this conflict. If you have been in conflict as a believer, amen, that's fantastic. The struggle is good. The struggle is good. That means you're dealing with stuff. Jacob thought, I will try to appease him by sending gifts. And this is why he was doing all these things. When I see him in person, perhaps he'll be friendly to me. He's trying to cunning his way out of it. So the gifts were sent ahead while Jacob himself spent the night in the camp. Now, you know what? He, he didn't get any. He doesn't know. He still doesn't know. The army's still approaching. But the struggle for him, as with us, is a struggle is a sign for us that we're there's a potential for growth. As our, our faith grows, and I've talked about this before, and let me, this is a good place for me to talk about faith. Every time I talk about faith, um, I, I change how, how a lot of people, a lot of people talk about faith like it's this, kind of like it's fuel. And the more faith you have, the more God can work. So if I only had enough faith, then this thing would happen. That's not true. That's not a scriptural view of faith. Faith is the way by which we understand how God already is moving in the universe. So God make, makes true statements about the truth of reality. And we may be lied to about the truth of reality in some other way, but by faith we can dig down past that and see the truth. So faith is the way by which we see God, the experience God. They're like eyeballs. When God works powerfully in our life and we have faith, we recognize that God is working powerfully in my life or through my life. When we don't have faith, we go, well, it's neat how things just work out. What a coincidence, right? That's the difference. Now, as we trust in God and we hold up the truth that is, what, well, God said you're going to be with me, and God said you're going to get me through this, and God said this, but I'm struggling. The more we actually do that and we, we choose God's truth over what the runaway, we choose God's truth, the more we do that, then our faith grows, which means the next time that we have to make that statement, it becomes a little bit easier because we can see, oh, you know what, I see God's moving in this way. You know what? God rescued me from an army with Laban just a few days ago, and now God rescued me from an army from Esau. See, that's kind of that's that's spiritual growth. Uh, during the day, um, Jacob got up and he took his two wives, his two servants, uh, uh, his two servant wives, and his eleven sons, and he crossed the the uh, he crossed the Jabab River uh, with them and took them to the other side, and he went over with all his provisions. Uh, this left Jacob alone in the camp, uh, and a man came and wrestled with him until uh, dawn began to break. When, he, when the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's head and wrenched it out of socket. Then the man said, let, let me go, uh, the dawn is breaking. And this right here, by the way, is a very strange blessing. How many of you have read this story before? This is a very strange blessing. What's interesting, and this is, this is what I'm going to tell you. The interesting is, is right here Jacob asks something. He says, uh, he, he asks, what he's going to do is he's going to ask for the man to bless him. But the funny thing is that he, he had blessed him. He blessed, blessed, blessed him when he wrenched his hip out of his pocket. We're going to see that in a second. And this is kind of one of those things. See, uh, I'm going to chase the rabbit just for a second. Um, a, rit a religious rite, when we do something, um, a practice, like baptism, for example. Baptism is a physical picture of something that we identify, right? We dunk into the ground, or we, we dunk into the water. We go under the water because we're identifying with being buried, right? With Jesus. And then what did Jesus do? He raised from the dead, right? So that we don't leave you under the water. What we do, you raise out kind of a picture of the new life. So we're identifying with Jesus that. So that's kind of a picture. So a spiritual right, in the best sense, is one of those places when they're, they're physical illustrations of a spiritual truth. And this is, gonna, this is kind of weird, but what's happening here is almost a religious right. Because Jacob 
is spiritually struggling with God. He's on that border. He's like, I don't, you're telling me to go in, I want to obey, I'm terrified, I can't, I want to run, but I, so he's struggling, and he's been struggling with God for several days right here on the thing. And what happens is that he has a physical struggle with the angel of the Lord right here. So Jacob's spiritual struggles live down in this interesting physical struggle. And what happens is God, through this physical struggle, actually helps solve the spiritual struggle, is what happens. Uh, but Jacob said, uh, I, but Jacob said, I'll not let you go unless you bless me. Uh, what's your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob, uh, your name will no longer be Jacob. The man told him, from now on you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. He's telling you your name. Jacob said, why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Uh, Jacob named the place which uh, means the face of God, uh, for he said, I have seen God face to face, uh, and yet my life is spared. And the sun was rising, and Jacob left uh, Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his head. Now, can you run away if he's limping? So God took, God took the, uh, the only other thing off the table. So Jacob, in his struggle, said, I want to obey you. But my fear won't let me obey you. But I want to obey you. And he kept struggling. And by God crippling him. Made it so that the only thing he can do. Is obey. So what happens is like. This is the blessed discomfort. God, God has, has gifted him. By crippling him. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> it hurts. But see, God, God plays a really, really, really long game. We sometimes, we think of, of things in a very short term, like what's comfortable to me right now, but that's not how God works. God works on the eternal level. God works for what benefits, uh, what benefits on the eternal level, not, not what is happening right now. And you know, for me, back when I worked with, again, with Marines, as a chaplain, I'd be talking to them, and I would try to get them to see something longer, and I, they would be sitting there, and I'd say, listen, who I'm worried about, you know, what I'm trying to do is I'm, I, I'm not really interested in, in where you're at right now. I'm trying to, to talk to the version of you that's sitting on the porch at 90. So things that are going to be successful to, for the person sitting on the porch at 90 are the important things now. And, you know, trying to shift their perspective past whatever the immediate one. Um, but you know what? It's the same thing here. God does the same thing. He's like, listen, we, we say, hey, you know, God, we, we tell God all the time, if only we had this girl or this boy, or if only we had kids or didn't have kids, or whatever the deal is, we tell God how we think our life would be better if it looked like this. And God's not interested in what we think the next year of our life should look like. He's interested in what will be in eternity. And those two things don't always go the same. There is more than one time in my life that I've wanted to do something I ought not do or because of some sort of physical thing or because of some sort of other thing the door was closed. Thankfully, it was closed. I may not have been happy about it. But it's true. It's true. God meddles like that for His children because we ask Him to. Because we say, not my will, but Your will. Your kingdom come, whose will be done? The bedrock of thought, of thought. So then Jacob looked up. He saw him stop coming with 400 men. Uh, so he divided the children of Leah, uh, two servants. He's getting ready to go. Uh, but we'll, we'll skip down there. Then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. And they both wept. God, no. It wasn't because of the, the bribes that went. God meddled in Esau's heart. God was preparing. God was preparing him. Jacob had no way to know that God had prepared himself. And God yet granted peace right here. For these two nations are at peace for this season. And it's a great, beautiful thing. But it's true for us too. Is that sometimes for us, what we do, is we confuse what's comfort for what's, what's comfortable in our life for what's good in our life. Now, I'm not going to tell you that every discomfort is a good thing. But I'm also not going to tell you every comfort is either. 
So comfort and discomfort have very little to do with good or bad. Does that make sense? Take it back, and I use the gym analogy. Again, it doesn't look like I, but there's been points in my life where I have used a gym, so I know how the rules work. Going to a gym and making yourself uncomfortable because you're doing the, gym, the, the weights improperly, is that going to get you in shape? No. So just looking to suffer for the sake of suffering isn't going to be good for you. However, going to the gym and just drinking water because you like water and then leaving, is that going to get you in shape either? So you can't confuse comfort for being either good or bad. You just have to, it's a state of being. So listen, going and eating ice cream with a friend, if it's God's will in your life, it's absolutely the right thing to do. And it's the best thing you can do. Somebody, somebody struggling with a big issue in life, you know what? Going to Kilman's and having an ice cream cone with somebody is not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. More important than Sunday school. Showing Jesus to somebody. God asking you to, to change and give up something that you just, you had a hard time to give up when God's asking you to step out of that. In that case, that's the most important thing for you to do too. So what we need to do is we need to get down there. We need to figure out, first of all, which truth are we, are we honoring? Are we honoring God's truth? And a good way to find God's truth is be sitting in God's Word. It's great. He gave, gave us 66 books for us to learn His voice. Going, going where God, uh, going where in your life where you want to go and God wants to go. Kind of that Venn diagram. I need to see. These are the places I want to go. These are the places God wants me to go. I'm only going to go in this circle. No, that's not how it works. That's not obedience. Obedience is, this is where I want to go. This is where God wants me to go. Obedience is, I will go where God wants me to go. question now I've got for you is, if you're a believer, where is God challenging you? Somewhere He's challenging you. Now, in a second, I'm going to pray, and then we'll dismiss you. If God has moved you to get connected, to get involved, to do something, we do have those connection cards. We do believe that churches connecting together and praying and supporting each other are, are kind of the way that God likes to do things. So if you want us to be your prayer partners in that, fill it out, and then drop it in the cheer boxes. That's where, where we take our offering on the way out. Um, drop it in those. Let us know. Uh, or give it to somebody here. We're a close, close group. But recognize that having an eye on the eternal and God's truth is going to change how we see our daily struggles. And that is amazing. Let's go to the Lord and turn. Almighty God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you that wherever we started today, wherever we started in our journey, that you as our leader, as our Lord, as our as the, as the guy who, our, our loving master, uh, that you set forward a plan for us. And those places where it is difficult to follow that plan, we know in confidence, just like with Jacob, that you are there with us. That there is no difficult step that we take in our life. There's no difficult step that we take in our life following your plan that is apart from you. We know that you're with us. Surely to the end of the age. Lord, we ask that, you know, those relationships that maybe in our life that we have not represented Jesus for, or Jesus well, maybe uh, folks who rightly think we, we said mean things to them or, or judged them in poorly or, 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 or cheated them or whatever happened, Lord, we pray that we can go back into all of our relationships and, uh, and through your grace and your courage, step forward and represent you in those relationships in our past. And then from this day forward, we represent you uh, in all of our other relationships. Lord, that is our prayer. Our prayer is that when we hear that command to go and make disciples of, of, of uh, all nations, um, that, that that command goes to us. But with it, that promise that you're with us, even through the difficulty. And Lord, we thank you for that. 
We thank you for this call. We thank you for this provision. We thank you for this equipment. We thank you for this blessing. Lord, we pray as we go out this, uh, this week that you turn the way that we see the world to, uh, to the, 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 the lies and the confusion that the world has, has sometimes painted over reality. But Lord, that we see past that through faith to see the reality that is there. Lord, help us not see people uh, the, the way that they make us feel by, their, by anger or, uh, or prejudices or, or past hurt, but instead, let us see them through your loving eyes. Lord, we thank you for all these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The way I'm going to close, I pray, uh, number six on you, I pray the Lord bless you and keep you, that he makes his face shine upon you, he's gracious to you, and he gives you peace.